I just want to thank everybody that took part with the uh, construction. It's a tradition that uh, I think we want to continue next year. I think it's a good thing. I think it'll help out uh, the whole state. I know as I talked to Region 4, they're planning on taking their cans with them back down south and uh, donating it to the food bank down there. So I just want to thank everybody for their participation in that and something that will continue. Our next speaker today is uh, was appointed the deputy director of UDOT last year. He's worked at UDOT for 22 years. Prior to being the deputy director, he was the director at Region 3. Although he graduated from BYU, Shane is a, considers himself a big Utah fan. Especially now that they're winning, so he's a big Utah, Utah fan there. The first time I uh, became aware of Shane, I was talking to my boss, uh, Scott Andrus, and he just moved down to Region 3 and was in the materials area. And he was telling me about one of the guys that was working with him. And at that time, he said, this, this guy, Shane, he is a smart cookie. Someday, both you and I are going to be working for him. And Scott was absolutely right. We are now both working for Shane, and he is a smart cookie. Over the years, I've had the opportunity to work with Shane and uh, have really come to appreciate the uh, talents that he has and uh, the uh, abilities that he has as a leader. I'd just like to let him know that I appreciate him and and very, uh, what's the word? I, I'm having a hard time coming up with the word, but love. love? <laughs> I love you, Shane. <laughs> anyway, so I don't keep fiddling around up here. I'll introduce Shane and have him come to stage. Everybody, if you'd please welcome Shane Marshall, our deputy director. Thanks, Dave. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for acknowledging my strong love for the Utah Utes. I really appreciate that. Um, one thing that I've learned over the last year that if you come up on stage like this in front of 1,600 of your closest friends and you poke at your college rival, expect it to get right back. Um, Utah fans have long, long memories. See, that was a Utah fan. They have long memories, but thankfully, they're very gracious, too. And to prove it, they've given me a hat and a Utah tie that I wear never, but proudly when I do. So I appreciate that. But just so you know, there's going to be no Utah jokes this year. I'm going to keep it nice and clean. There we go. I want to start a little bit about, we started planning this this speech, our speeches, Carlos and I's speeches, about four months ago. And four months ago, we made the decision to do this kind of Steve Jobs thing with no podium. And I have to say, four months ago, it made a lot of sense. It, was, it sounded like a great idea. But now that I'm up here and there's no podium to just hide behind, it's a little bit intimidating. So on Monday, we came over and we, uh, we practiced a little bit. And I was getting a lot of advice a lot of constructed criticism about how I should or shouldn't walk along the stage. At first I was running back and forth and put my hands in my pocket. No, 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 you can't do all of these things. So I appreciate it. They were only looking out for me and they only wanted me to look good and I appreciate that. But what they didn't realize is as soon as I stepped right there, that's all gone. I forgot all about that. So if you see my hands like float like Ricky Bobby anytime soon, I'm not crazy. It's just that I'm really trying to focus on giving this at presentation. So with that in mind, let's get started. So this last year has been the first year in really 20 years where I've had a chance to really step back and see UDOT as a whole. I've been a place where um, I've been in a region or a group where you see just bits and pieces of UDOT. You don't really get a chance to see what UDOT's all about. But this year I got to see from aeronautics to comptrollers, from 
port of entry to project development from region one to region four, I really got a good chance to get out of the state and really see how people work and really see how our, our employees are committed to doing a good job. And they really want all of us to look good. They're out there working hard to make us look good and to reach our goals. And it's just not our, our folks, it's our consultants and our contractors as well, really working together to make sure that, that we accomplish our goals. But I wasn't surprised by this. This attitude was in every other place I'd been. Um, so while I wasn't surprised, I was extremely impressed and also very humbled to be able to walk into anywhere in, in the DOT and find a place where people are just working their tails off to accomplish our goals. So oftentimes you see us up here talking about we need, we need to work together to accomplish our goals. And sometimes that can sound a little bit, of cliche, a little bit of cliche. But really there's a lot of meaning behind that. And I want to give a little bit of example. It takes a little time, so bear with me. But I want to give a little example of what I mean. And I want to start by just saying the goal is the, our strategic goal of preserving infrastructure. I want to take a very small piece of that, filling a pothole, and ask anyone, who do you think it's their, your responsibility to fill a pothole? Very few folks, very few folks. The first thing that comes to mind is that's, that's a maintenance function, right? But I don't think that's true, truly the answer. I want to start from the beginning. So let's start from the fact that we have a corridor, and we, I don't know what this means. Stop that. So we have a corridor, and we need to put a road in it. So first thing we do, we hire a PM. They hire a design team, whether that's in-house or a consultant, and we go to work on the design. Part of that design is a pavement design, a pavement design that's going to last 20 to 40 years, a pavement design that hopefully will eliminate any potholing in that corridor. They get that design, and they ship it up to our central construction for advertising. Central Construction gets the project out to our contracting community. They bid on a project, and we award it to one of our great um, contractors. And we expect that our contractors will de deliver good quality, a good quality project. And we have a few folks out on the job to help them with that, that message or that, that goal with our construction inspectors and our trans techs. They're out there verifying that we get a good product from, the, from our con contractors. So once the, the road is built, brand new road, open to the public. Now our port of entry folks, working with UHP, have a job to make sure that they don't let overweight illegal loads on that section. Because we all know what happens when you put overweight loads on a road, it starts to get beat up and potholes are formed. But inevitably, after years of freeze-thaw, a pothole will form. So when a pothole forms, <laughs> the TOC usually notices, they have cameras everywhere, they're watching all. And so they'll pick up the phone and they'll call a region and say you have a pothole. And our region dispatches the maintenance forces. And you think it's over there, but it's not over. There's a little bit more to come. So our maintenance forces go to fix the pothole, but they can't fix a pothole unless they have material. Well, they can't have material unless our procurement division has put together a contract for them to go get this material, whether it's asphalt, concrete, or whatever it is. So they go get ready to fix it. They want to put up some traffic control. Well, before they even get on the road, our public involvement folks need to let the public know that we're going to be out there. So they go to set up traffic control. They can't set up traffic control unless they have standards and specifications developed by our traffic and safety group. So now, all that's in place, they fix the pothole. Again, it's not over yet. The material supplier still needs to get paid. So they send that bill to the region admin folks, the region admin folks, the same people that make sure we get paid, make sure the supplier gets paid. That, that bill goes into the system and now it's up to our comptroller's office and our central materials, our central maintenance office to reconcile the budgets so that we know where we're at through the year. Now, I ask you all again, how many do you believe do you, believe you have a responsibility to fix a pothole? Did I miss anybody? I have a sneaky suspicion that Lyle over here is saying, you missed right there, the Ute fans. They're saying, 
See what you get for popping off one year? This is what happens. They're saying, you missed right away. And in fact, I did. We couldn't have been there. That road couldn't have been there unless somebody had purchased that right away. So really, it's Lyle's responsibility to fix potholes. So from now on, call Lyle. <laughs> and his numbers should be right behind me. So it's been just 24 hours since Carlos shared his new vision, keeping Utah moving. Utah moving. And I think that really captures what we're trying to accomplish here. And I think you can see from that example that it really does take everyone, everyone in this room working together to be successful. Everyone working, doing their, it might be a small part, but doing their jobs to keep Utah moving. So last year, and again this year, Carlos and a few of us got a chance to tweak our vision, our mission, and our goals. Now if you're having a hard time keeping up with these changes, welcome to my world. Carlos has a ton of energy, and a ton of energy to keep our organization on the right path. So he's constantly thinking about where are we going next? How are we going to accomplish that? And he thinks about it a lot. And therefore, I get to share in some of those conversations with him. But after I catch up to him and I catch my breath, I realize that it is critical that we change our goals to make sure that we're meeting the challenges that are coming. But I want to make it clear that we're not changing these goals because we thought they were bad or that we thought that we were not doing our jobs correctly. We're changing them because the situation we find ourselves is evolving. And the pressures that we're getting from the public or from our elected officials are constantly changing, and we need to be prepared to address what's in front of us. So for years, our evidence has been on designing, building, and maintaining roads. And we've done this very, very well. But as we move forward to address the challenges that this state's going to face, the things that made us the most successful in the past, like innovation, quality, and efficiency, well, they'll continue to serve us. And while we won't stop designing, building, and maintaining roads, we need to start focusing a little bit more on operating the system, a system that you all helped create. So now that we have, we have shifted our goals and tweaked our goals, our goals are now aligned with the idea of us helping us accomplish this focus, of trying to squeeze out every bit of capacity out of our system. To, in order for us to meet the challenge that Carlos described last week, yesterday, 2.5 million people in this valley, we're going to have to squeeze out every single bit of efficiency out of our system. And I think our goals are now aligned to help us do that. So yesterday, Carlos laid out our vision for the next year. But, to but today, I want to take a minute and reflect back on the last year. Our emphasis areas were rolled out, and I wanted to see how we accomplished them in our day-to-day -day business. And I know when Carlos rolled our emphasis areas out, there was a lot of anxiety about how are we gonna accomplish them? But in reality, they were nothing new. And I think we found that over the years, that they were, the last year, that they really were nothing new. It was just a direction to, from Carlos to focus on these six places in the next year. And I wanna share with you how I think we accomplished those. And certainly this is not representative of, across the board. I can't pick examples from everywhere, just very specific examples on where I think we accomplished them. So integrated transportation was one emphasis area that definitely had the most questions asked of any of the six. Questions like, what do you mean, Carlos, Shane? How are we going to accomplish this? Are we going to be in the transit business now and move away from the road business? And the answer to that was simply no. We're going to be in the transportation business. And as the population grows and the demand for different modes increase and options increase, we need to be able to integrate our system into the other systems. That's all that means. It doesn't mean that we're going to build other systems. It means we're going to make our system function effectively with other systems. So while we don't plan on doubling our system, we're going to need help in meeting the demands that are coming, that we're going to be facing. We're going to need transit and we're going to need other modes to make our system successful. Some would say this is a pretty big shift in our organization. I think that's just barely a shift, maybe a little tweak, not much as a shift. We're not asking you to overhaul the way we do things. We're not asking you to radically change our projects. We're talking about making small connections from one system to the next, making sure that our system is benefited from the local system or the transit system. We want to make sure that we can accommodate more than just cars and trucks in our system. 
But how we do this can be very, wi widely, very widely. We don't, we don't expect there'll be a big impact on scope, schedule, or budget. And let me give you an example of where I think it was very successful. So Region 2 did a project this last year on Redwood Road. Peter Tang was our project manager. And something we've been doing for years is a simple road to mill and overlay. Road to mill and overlays are our bread and butter. We do them 80% of the time. It's what we've been doing forever and we do them well. But the team started asking them a few more questions, started collaborating with Salt Lake City, and they, asked, they said, how can we integrate more modes into this, into this project? And the, and the, the uh, solutions they came up with were just elegantly simple, very simple solutions. They took a 14-foot median turn lane, and they squished it down to 12 feet. They took the shoulders from 8, and they squished them. They actually took them from 12, and they squished them to 8. And I'm going to coin the phrase squished as an engineering term from now on. So anytime we shrink, narrow, it's squished. This led them an, enough room to put five a five-foot bike lane in each direction. It still left them with four, foot travel, four 12 foot travel lanes and parking on each side. They installed some radar detection at key intersections with a, with a bicycle um, message on the pavement so the bicycles would know where to stop so they could get detected. So without much investment at all on our part, very little investment on our part, they were able to take a corridor that was once basically trucks and cars and add a whole nother mode to it and add it safely. And now bikes can get up and down that corridor without a problem. So while our role is in supporting transit is, going to, is growing, and it's continued to grow, it's not a major change in what we're doing. We still want to just find those little places within our system that we can make those connections. So I think we need to start by not how revolutionary can we be, but how simple can we be, and start asking the same questions that our Redwood Road project team did, and ask our partners, how can we accommodate just one more mode into this project? into this scope that we have been given, how can we do one more thing? We're not talking about tearing down a row of homes to put in a transit or a trail. We're talking about within our limited ability, how can we do better? And last year at this time, Carlos asked if you would raise your hand if you felt like part of your job was to support transit. I think there were two people, both from UTA, raising their hands. And I think if I asked this year, I'm not going to, it's a rhetorical question. But if I asked this year if you think your role was to support transit, I think everyone's hands would come up almost immediately. So collaboration, again, nothing new, something we've been doing in our organization for years. The goal was just to emphasize the importance of doing collaboration in our project teams. And every month, Carlos and I get to travel around the state, the cities across the state meet with our transportation commission. And as part of those meetings, there's an opportunity for public input. And over the last several of them, there's been a common theme emerge. We hear the local governments, our stakeholders come to the, the podium and they talk about UDOT as being collaborative. They're being team players and they're willing to listen to other ideas. And our stakeholders are finding this out firsthand because of the experiences they have had with our project teams and our staffs, including our consultants and contractors. It's just not coming from us, it's coming from our contractors out on the job, working with local governments, responding and working in a collaborative way. And to me that says, collaboration is truly becoming a core part of our organization's identity. We can help local governments in many ways. From, this is taking clicker, sorry. This thing is really sensitive. <laughs> I'm gonna do this. All right, so we can help communities in many different ways. <clears throat> we, can, we can work with them before the project begins. We can work with them to coordinate their city with their city staff on a day-to-day -day basis. We also can work with the MPO while they're out collaborating with the local governments. We can be right there with them doing more collaboration to develop the long-range plan. You know, our region maintenance folks have been taking this to heart for many, many years. I had a chance when I was down in Region 3 to go on many semi-annuals, and at every single place I would hear a story about how our maintenance forces were working with the city's maintenance forces to solve problems. Sometimes those problems were on our system, sometimes those problems were on their system, but they knew who to call, they knew, what, that it, they knew if they called them they would respond, just like one of our employees. 
That is collaboration. But over the last year, Region 3 has decided to take it to a different level, to take collaboration to a different level. Terry and her folks have developed what they're calling a local coordination map. This map is a GIS map that documents all communication and coordination between the local government and the region. It's accessed by anyone in the region and it shows all conversations that are taking place. So when a designer starts to design a project, they can quickly pull up this map and see what the local government might be working on, whether it's a water line, a new access, or whatever it might be, they can now take those concepts and move them into the project so we're out there building the project just once, limiting the disruption to the community. Very powerful tool. But collaboration doesn't end with UDOT. Like I said before, our contractors, our consultants have a lot to do with how we collaborate. And I know there's not one consultant or, or contractor or supplier or academic out here today that hasn't had a chance to sit down with one of our local partners or stakeholder and talk about a project we're working on. And I think they know when they do that, they are representing the Department of Transportation and they do that very, very well. The next emphasis area is education. And when we rolled this out, the very first question, the very first thing we heard was, is that really our job? But that lasted about 10 minutes, really. And since that initial reaction, I think most of us believe they can and should encourage the youth of our state to be part of our industry, especially with the challenges that we're going to be facing. We need to make sure that uh, the upcoming generation is prepared for the issues that we'll be facing them, issues that they will have an opportunity to solve for themselves. So we need to share our knowledge with them. And again, it's not just been our employees. Our industry partners have helped to join us as well. In all areas of Utah, you will find a UDOT employee, a consultant, a contractor, out in classrooms teaching the students what we do and how it impacts their lives. For example, our motor carriers group, you know, part of getting ready for this presentation, you learn all sorts of things. And this is just the best part. Our motor carriers group has given 91 presentations to our local high schools over the past six months, 91 presentations. And they plan to do more as the year comes as the year continues. They talk about how to drive safely around trucks, what the role of trucks plays in transportation, in our economy, and our quality of life. I really need to get with Chad and his folks to have them come down to Salem Hills High School where my daughter goes. She's been driving now for a, a year. She's a decent driver, but when she gets around a truck, she's a little skittish. And of course, she's not gonna listen to a thing I say, right? She's 17 years old. Dad, you don't know anything but maybe Chad and his folks can help her out with her education. I was recently down in Region 4 at a project delivery meeting, and we were talking about the emphasis areas and, and how they related to Region 4 and what they were doing to work on their emphasis areas. And they told me a story about Mike Miles, who was at that moment in a high school teaching engineering and geology to students there, telling them the concepts that we use to make decisions that relate to transportation. He took the time out of his day to go over to high school and really impart what he believes is important for them to learn as they grow older. Incredible story. I also learned that our structures group, along with our materials testing group, has been out to the local elementaries teaching the kids about what a structure is and what kind of, ro what kind of material goes into a roadway. Again, it's just been amazing to see the, the excitement that our employees and our, our partners have had when they share their knowledge with students. And I really do look forward to seeing what's next. How are people will educate the youth of, of the youth of today as we share the responsibility to prepare the next innovative UDOT engineers and consultants and contractors. The next is transparency. So UDOT is known for one of, to be known to be one of the most transparent organizations in the state of Utah and nationally. So when we rolled this out, we really didn't expect to do things differently. Our goal was just to say how important trans transparency was. We want to emphasize that importance and remind people to keep doing the good work that they were doing. But like all these uh, e emphasis areas, they raised the bar. And they did it in several ways. First, our UDOT project webpage. This webpage shows you, you can click on any project that we're actively working on today and see scope, schedule, and budget. You can see the project manager, 
have their phone number in there, their email address in there, which they love, I'm sure. But you can find out all the information you want on a project. We also work in on a three-year plan that we're putting into our Uplan tool. It'll be able to show the public everywhere we plan to be in the next three years. And I know our, our program managers are a little bit nervous about committing to something three years out, but we're gonna do our best with the, with the information we have today to say this is what our plans are over the next three years. So local governments and stakeholders can get ready to, and anticipate us coming. And then we developed a couple of applications for our mobile smartphone. The first one was our citizen reporter tool. And that really helps us gauge the, the level of snowplow effort and the condition of our roads during a snowstorm. Someone can log in and instantly say, this road was snowy. Goes up to the TOC, and we use that as a data point to determine how well we're doing. And the fourth thing is UDOT Click and Fix. So many of you have, may have heard of UDOT Click and Fix, and some of you have been helping us refine it over the last several months in order to prepare for the, the public launch that's coming in January. But for those of you who haven't had a chance to see it, let me tell you a little bit about it. It creates a whole new way for the public to be involved with what we do. The idea actually came from Speaker of the House, Becky Lockhart. We were in a meeting with her a few years ago, and she said, why can't I pick up my phone, click on a map, and let you know there's a problem out there? Uh, I don't know why you can't do that. So we, we challenged our folks to go back and start working on that application, and out came you click and fix. So you can do just that. You download the app, you open it up, you pull up a map of where you are or where you've been, and you say, there was a problem here. There was a pothole, a signal out, bad traffic control, whatever it was, that gets immediately sent back to us and we know there was a problem. This has created a great convenience for the public. It gives them a chance to, without calling or without exchanging emails, gives, us, gives them a chance to report back to us what's going on out there. But I think more importantly than that, in my opinion, far more importantly than that, it gives us a chance to communicate back to them how well we are doing. We have done so well over the years in responding to those kind of concerns that now we have a chance to say, look, we're done. We have closed your issue. It took us two days. It took us one day. Whatever it's taken us, we're done with your issue. Thank you for giving that to us. And I think this instantly demonstrates how well we can keep Utah moving. So you'll hear more about Utah Click and Fix in the months to come. I think it really will streamline our communications with the public. And it is an example of how, how our process here at UDOT's UDOT, at UDOT is continually changing. The public really does expect mobility, instant access, and confirmation of very fast results, and this application allows us to deliver those expectations to them. So transparency is something that I really, never really thought about before, before this emphasis area. I figured it was something we just did. We were just transparent. I didn't realize the value that the public sees in us being transparent. And they aren't really necessary, necessarily concerned about the how. They can see the how we do things. They can see us move bridges or install signals. They know the how. What they want to understand is the why. Why we do the things we do. And even if they don't like the outcomes, they can, if we can explain the thought process to them, we can build trust and buy-in from them and really meet their expectations. So as soon as Carlos walked off the stage last year, after I think three, four hours, I'm not sure what it was. It was a little bit of time. The first question I got, even before I got up on stage was, you mean we don't care about quality? It had to be an emphasis areas, area? The answer was, of course we cared. We cared greatly and we took quality very seriously. We were always striving for quality in everything we were doing. While we cared greatly about scope, schedule, and budget, what we were concerned about was that we may be forgetting a little bit about quality, and we wanted to make sure everyone knew quality was important to us. We want to make every product we do better. I want to share a, a striking statistic with you all. In 2013, the 2013 Utah Public Opinion Survey, we, the, the people were asked, would you say UDOT ensures all projects are of high quality? And 91% of the people said yes. 91%, that is an amazing number. You can't get 91% of people to agree that the sky is blue. I'll bet you can't get, I can't get 91% of all of you to agree this is the best presentation you've ever heard. <laughs> but clearly it is. What they do agree about is that you are doing a good job and that they value that work and they believe you are delivering a quality product. 
So I hope you are as proud of that number as I am. You've worked hard for it, and I think you will work even harder to make it even higher. So as part of our emphasis with quality, we created what we're calling our quality management division. And their job is not to say, how do we make our concrete better? Or how do we make our asphalt better? Their job is to look at our processes and say, are those processes generating the right outcomes? Are there things within that process that are just getting in the way of us doing good work? So they've been sitting down with a bunch of our folks going through processes and what they have found is that we have, a lot of pro we have a lot of people out there working really hard to hold together processes that sometimes need improvement. So their goal is to strengthen what we do by eliminating some of those steps and streamlining the process. Operational excellence. This, this emphasis area was really geared towards executing the governor's success framework. He wants every state agency to be 25% more efficient by 2016. And to that effort, we've identified six emphasis areas, or six efficiency areas that our folks are gonna work on over the next year and a half. They've been working on them a year, we have another couple years to get them done. Snow and ice control, pre-construction, heavy equipment, procurement, port of entry truck processing, and grants of access. So you can see these really span the entire breadth of UDOT. And we really believe that after, after we're through with these, we will become a much more efficient organization. In fact, Rod McDaniels has led a team to look at our access approval process. We looked at how do they streamline the permitting application? How do we make a decision for our, our applicants quicker? So we standardize a two-part packet where the applicant fills out one part, they give it to us, we can start looking at, at some of this, the data, and then another part comes in. They also developed a performance dashboard so we can clearly see where the time to make a decision is, whether it's on a UDOT side or on the applicant side. And we're really looking forward to really streamlining that process. And to date, that process has been improved by 20% in just a short year. So it's a great job by Ryan and his team, this team right here. While we have implemented many efficiencies in our organization over the years, there still remains opportunities to examine everything we do and make them even better. So while we found that the motivating forces behind operational excellence and quality to be, we found them to be very similar. The desire to be good stewards of the public taxpayer dollars and a philosophy of continual process improvement. They really went together and they, those things were being said loud and clear on those two emphasis areas. So what we decided to do is fit operational excellence under the, the, the quality emphasis area and reduce the number of emphasis areas from five, from six down to five. And I think you'll notice that on, on the card you had yesterday, there's only five emphasis areas. While we still believe that this work is important, we think Robert Stewart's, Stewart and his group can roll it into the quality management division and still accomplish what we hope to accomplish. So while I think our values remain consistent and constant, our vision isn't going to change anytime soon, but our emphasis areas, our goals and objectives will continue to evolve to meet the shifting demands of our state. But that's okay. We're adaptable, we're innovative, and we're wired to come alive when faced with new challenges that, that need innovative solutions. I think of what we've done over this past year and in so many years before, how those characteristics have helped us to become one of the most respected transportation departments in the country. And we've earned that honor, you have earned that honor because of the efforts of everyone in this room. So I'd like for everyone to pull out their card that you all got yesterday. I know you've been packing around with you because Carlos said he was going to test you. You don't really have to pull them out if you don't have them. But I want you to think about what's on this card. The vision, the mission, the strategic goals, the emphasis areas, and our core values. And I want you to internalize our vision, keeping Utah moving. Very, very simple. Think about how that relates to your job and how you're going to do your job to, to meet that vision. And also remember the mission statement, because it really believes that everyone truly does innovate solutions to strengthen Utah's economy and enhance quality of life in the state. There's just one thing I don't want you to do. Don't walk away from today feeling overwhelmed by this change, wondering if those changes are a message that we're trying to fix something that's broken, because that's not the case at all. If you have questions, if you have concerns, grab one of your seating leaders, grab Carlos or I, and ask us questions. Don't go away wondering. 
There are a couple of meet and greet sessions still to come today and tomorrow with Carlos and I. Come out and ask us. Make us tell you what you want to hear. Email us if you want to, if you don't feel comfortable talking to us. My email address is lmcmillan at utah.gov. And I'm sure I'll get every one of those messages. No, really, email me if you have a chance. We'd love to talk about it. We, Carlos and I love to talk about this stuff, and you can get us talking about it forever. So please come talk to us about it. So there's one thing, if you listen to one thing I have to say today, hear this. Please, jeez, we are doing a great job. You all are doing a great job. Everyone in this, everyone in this room is doing a great, great job. All we want you to do is keep doing it and do it everywhere. If you take anything else away, please take that one thing away. So together, we really have built a legacy as pioneers in our industry with things like ABC, world-class signals, and innovative intersections. We have really become leaders across the country. We meaning the state of Utah. Not necessarily the Utah Department of Transportation, but we in this room, our industry, has become leaders of innovation across the country. But I think the most exciting innovations are still ahead. And as we face some of the biggest challenges in our state's history, the challenges that Carlos mentioned yesterday, 2.5 million people in our little area. I believe the innovations that will help Utah most will be the thousand little things that we come up with, not the one big thing, as we work towards our goal of keeping Utah moving. So thank you. Thank you, Shane. I also want you to know that you're doing a good job, too. Um, and I'm glad that I came.